Benj, good to see you, man. Man, I'm excited to talk about your new book. Thanks, man. I, um, I always enjoy every time we get to hang out. You've got such infectious energy. Uh, the fact that you actually read the book is amazing because sometimes you show up to talk about it and it's like, you know, you're talking to a wall that has no experience with it. So the fact that you've got to, you know, interact with it is, is special. So I'm glad to be here. Well, not only did I read it, I can highly relate to it. I, I have gone through the journey, the roller coaster ride that is, as you describe, um, you know, that of a renegade founder before they become a renegade leader. So as I just alluded that to the offense, uh, audience, I gave them a little bit of, you know, peek into it. Why don't you kind of dig into your book, what you shared, but I mean, you're really sharing your life. Yeah, it is. It is. And it got a little vulnerable and, and I'm not a great storyteller of things that have had. So I really had to pull that side out of it. I'm very like logical mental models. How does this fit? Um, let's make the bullet point. So it was fun. And then even getting to the point where, um, people were put my, the, my co-author Mackenzie was pushing yeah. me like, no, let's put some pictures in here. Like, <laughs> let's make it real. And I'm like, all right, here's my kid pictures. You, <laughs> you pick something. And so, yeah, it was definitely a little bit different. Um, I got, I got a lot of my inspiration for this book was from a aesthetic standpoint is from a book called Fect Perfection. Okay. By James Victoria. And James is a brilliant kind of advertising but his art's very off the wall and, and his book um was just like through all the rules of writing a book out the window and i was so like freed up by that like oh if i could write a book like that then i'm in and so yeah. it, it created the pathway but it is a story um it is for founders because that is kind of my path and my mm -hmm. story and I, it's very, very niche. I know not all leaders are founders, um, and there are great leaders that are not, and there are bad leaders that are, and, but there's a journey that I've found as I've gotten to work with a lot of founders, that's very consistent and it might not be one for one perfectly, but, um, uh, so we really wrote this, uh, at the end, you know, maybe we'll get into it, but there's kind of sh six shifts that yeah. we can make as founders to go from a renegade founder to a renegade leader mm -hmm. and that that founders gap that we call it in between the two can feel like a giant uncrossable chasm and one of the ways that people try and get a, across it is kind of kind of the uh i don't mean any disrespect for this but like the harvard business review version yeah. of getting across it means changing who you are yeah. who you were created to be and I don't think that that's the way that actually serves the founder the best or the world that they're they're in. Okay, so let's let's just camp there for a second because I appreciate and get that and you know again in your book you um you know made reference to that. One of the things that I had to learn though is the mask of my insecurities actually was different than who I showed up. And so I actually had to become my real true self in order that I could go through the gap myself because I was trying to be this identity of what the world wanted, you know, kind of, again, the same what you're saying, but the flip of it. My, what I started to be is I thought this is what the yeah. world needed, but I really had to become my true, vulnerable, honest self in that journey for, for me. Um, and so I think that's where I, I hear what you're saying, but it's, it's almost sometimes flipped. It's stop being who you're not. Yeah. So that's, so when we, we spend some time in the, we call it the dilemma in the beginning, like setting up the problem and where we all find ourselves. Uh, but the very, very first thing that we get into, when we get into the solution side of it, it starts with working on ourselves and our own identity. And, um, uh, yes, it's our insecurities of the things we're not. There's also some, uh, I literally heard somebody the other day say, I don't have any blind spots. I was like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know that you can actually say that. Um, uh, so like, you know, where are the blind spots, but, um, ultimately, uh, through the research of Tim Spiker and, and his partner, Vanessa, the, um, a good friend of mine, John Ott, uh, their, their leadership model and the research that they did 
really brought this whole idea down to two things. And, and it's, it's the thing yeah. that is most impactful in your, anyone's leadership, which is being inwardly sound and others focused. And so, yes, we're going to go on a journey and you're going to have to make six shifts, but you're going to have to do some internal work first. And it starts with, you are the leader. And so you go, so goes the organization. My, um, my coach, when I first started working with him, he said, Benj, every organizational issue is a reflection of the heart of the leader. Did that, 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 that comment that you made that quote, did that just, I mean, I have it highlighted, I have it underlined, I have it circled because that's it. So you, one thing it's keeping that close to our mind and kind of, you know, obviously this is a leadership podcast. We've talked about that before we're in this space, both of us, where we're trying to serve people in, in our current places, right? People that are trying to lead, whether it's the, the renegade founder, whether it's someone in an organization that maybe is working with a renegade founder yes. and, you know, it's really identifying those throughout, but going back to, to just that little comment just a second ago, that's setting the stage. It's all about your heart. And I love those two, you know, things here as I have them written down inwardly sound and others focused, no matter how technical, how, you know, masterful you are at sales and, and design, whatever else, if you're not inwardly sound and others focused, you're going to end up at the bottom of the chasm. You're going to be down at the bottom And ultimately, a lot of people end up there before they rebound, but. Yeah. It's, it's understanding that, Hey, you can be everything, but if you're not those two, it really doesn't matter. It, it, that's what you found, right? Yeah. And, and the, um, the research on this, which we put a little bit in the book, but if you're super interested, you can go deep. The, uh, Tim Spiker's book's called the only leaders worth following. Uh, it, the number is actually 77% of a leader's effectiveness is tied back to those two attributes of inwardly sound and others focus. So like think strategically, communicate effectively, marshal resources, hold people accountable, all these things, great things, but we can bundle all of that into the 23% of what a leader does. And that's 23% of their effectiveness, right? So we, it, we, we tend to not spend enough time there. Even organizationally, we talk about organizational development, personal development, professional development, and I'm at this point, I'm kind of looking at people going, really, how much time did you spend on the 77% that yeah. actually matters the most? Well, and I think it's, this is what I would suggest. It's easier for those leaders, founders, executives, put them all in a group because they're leading to focus on the 23%. It's a classic 80, 20. It's pretty darn close, right? 80, 20, yep. but we're, we're looking at the 20% that doesn't touch your heart. Yes. Yep. And that's where the hard part lies for sure. And, and so I want to take a moment here. Where did that hit you? Um, man, there were several, several points where I got smacked in the face with it. And one of the big ones was uh, part of my, my journey. I was a very soulful leader. So I always cared a lot about the people, the heart of the organization, the identity of the organization, the culture that people were in leadership development. Um, and I, that was my idea of what a great leader that would be fun to work for looked like. And I realized that as much as I cared, I was actually lacking dignity for some of the okay. people because I wasn't giving them clarity. Mm -hmm. So for, for me to say, um, Hey, five widgets a day and you need to do this and you need to do that and give you the exact, you know, this is why your job exists. This is exactly what I need from you. This is how we're going to measure it. And we're going to talk about it often that level of, of clarity, just to let somebody know, are they winning? People want to know, am yeah. I winning in life? And that's, that's one of those things that. Um, that's actually, we're getting into the, the third shift here, but, yeah. um, you know, going from, uh, all the shifts start with the rules that the world say. So the world says, know what you're getting into, but that, that renegade founder says, I'm going to go with my gut. 
It, it might not even be logical to set out on this, but, and the, they go out on their gut. Well, what happens over time is they do have a really strong gut. In most cases I'm using a lot of stereotypes, yeah. but a lot of times that, that, that gut is not scalable. So they get stuck mm -hmm. being the gut instinct for everything in the organization. And this is everything good or bad. And so what we need to shift to is to a, a mentality of knowing when we're winning. So if we can take that, that gut instinct that we have and really get clear about what that looks like to win. Now I can say, Tyler, this is what I need you to do. This is what winning looks like. And let's talk about it often. Here's what I, I found in through experiences. I was sharing with you an experience that I've had my family and I've gone through earlier this summer. And a lot of this actually leads into it. And I said to this person who was a leader, I said, people in this organization want to know where they stand. Yes. And they were lost. Yeah. They had no idea. They could not comprehend what I was asking them. I was, you know, it, I would say a, uh, like McKenzie is to you. I was to them, you know, McKenzie, you know, works with them, kind of helping Ben relate here. And, and it's like, I was there kind of helping them. I was doing things. I was helping within the organization, kind of giving a little bit of a look into what people were experiencing. And as I told him, and it's like, people want to know where they stand. They feel like at moments, the rug could be pulled out from underneath yes. them. Yes. And, and I think as, as I relate to that story, that recent experience and having gone through that with my wife and I working together in, in some of that, she's more of that renegade. Absolutely. That is her to a T. And as you describe it, and I think about Kelly, she wants no rules because she wants to make all the rules. And yeah. anytime there comes a rule, it's wrong because rules have always been wrong. Does that sound like anyone, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. And so as we, you know, as I think about this and I go through it, the problem with each of those circumstances may be the person that's just asking for clarity. And you may think, well, go do whatever you want. Unfortunately, they're not sure when they run into our guardrail. And then all yeah. of a sudden there's an issue because there's not enough clarity because you're like, and again, I'm playing this out and I want you to come back to me is because you're saying I'm giving you the entire world. Like I would want, I make my rules. I don't want to give you rules. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, so take and, that deeper. and we also, there's also a little bit of, you know, t you got to be a little bit crazy to go start a business or start a, anything. Um, and people, I, I always assumed that everyone was wired the same way that I was. Mm -hmm. So if I put you in a job, well, you just figure out the job and figure out what you need to yeah. do. And, and, and some people are like, really like, Hey, I will hit a home run for you. You just got to tell me how fast you're pitching and where you're putting it and yeah. what bat to use and where to swing, you know, what part of the fence you want me to hit it over. Yeah. Like some people just give me the list and let me knock it out. And so that, that for me to learn that, you know, what else is funny right now that? is that they stopped for a minute and lightning and thunder went like crazy. Oh, okay. So super awesome. I think he's right out my window. It's good. I mean, Hey, they got a job to do. He's hopefully doing an amazing job. I see him. He's blowing. It's good. They, they do do an amazing job. Yeah. See, that's what you want. <sighs> Give me two <laughs> seconds. We'll wait for him to walk away. You're good. See, now when I choose to tell my producer not to edit this because this is a real conversation. <laughs> did you hear that? I, I did. That was the thunder. That's good. So, That'll so make yeah. him quit. Yeah, this is... Uh... This is the epicenter right now. Oh, yeah. look. Okay. Here we okay. go. What were we talking about? Um, <laughs> you just, yeah, I mean, exactly. A squirrel, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I think we were, you know, we were talking about that, that tension of, of actually creating rules is too strong. I, I don't okay. love the, but structure, clarity, okay. system, you know, expectations, systems. even for some that's system, right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, that's where this whole thing came is because when I found good systems, it was, I mean, th this, this story was my wake up call. Cause I thought everybody's happy and this is perfect and we've got a great culture and all these things. And then, and we were in like a quarterly coaching conversation and I heard it like three times in the same day. Like, am I doing okay? I'm like, of course you are. And then the next person's like, I don't know if I'm doing a good job or not. And I'm yeah. like, I would tell you if you're not. Well, right? it's okay. Whoa, 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 time out, time out. That's the biggest thing that I think happens. Is that what you come? I just said, 
I would tell you if you're not. Unfortunately, that works for some people. That works for renegades. I, I think it does in some ways. Because I'm like, oh, I'll just keep going until you pull the reins back. That's right. As opposed to there's others, like you said earlier, it's just show me where the pitch is coming, what side of the, you know, all of those metrics. I'm not, I will absolutely be the best hitter you've ever seen, but I can't do it without clarity and understanding from you exactly what you need and want. Yeah. And the other problem is you kind of alluded to it earlier, but some people really need that. And some people have trauma based on when they haven't gotten it in the past. So they've operated out of autonomy and go, go, go. And then they've gotten lashed for it. And, and they, yeah. you're not going to do that again. Yeah. They're playing it safe. Yeah. Well, and, and sometimes it, it was almost inadvertent that, you know, they got in trouble that maybe you, Hey, you had an issue with a client. You had a, a situation where like, I didn't expect it to go that way, but uh Oh, well, that was a problem. And now they're like, I never want to say, for example, I'm working for you. And, and that happens. I never want to be there for, because I trust and I believe in Benji. I don't, I don't want to put Benji in that situation. And so sometimes they can fall into that case of being yeah. very held back, yeah. e- even though circumstantially it probably wasn't that big a deal. Yeah. yeah. The shift for me to go from not wanting to put a number on you Ooh. to the fact that that is actually the way that I give you the most dignity. That was the biggest mind shift for me because okay. just the, the, the clarity is actually appreciated on the other side. Well, I, I think part of this and, and you talked about the, this gap, this, you know, where the, the founder finds themselves and it's really understanding that, you know, the two points of being inwardly sound and others focused, and, and leadership starts with who you are. It, to me, there, you know, you said this earlier, we've talked about this before, is the leader's greatest opportunity is to lead themselves so they don't hurt and limit others by virtue of that being able to empower and help others accomplish. So move, making that transition of being inward focused in order to become outward centric how did, what steps were you taking there again, using experience that you just talked about? Yeah. So, um, when I became aware of this, um, I, I mentioned John, Ott, he's a good friend yeah. of mine. Um, and he was helping me understand the model and wrestle with the model. And so he took me through an actual assessment because I was curious, like, Oh, well, how would I know if I'm inwardly sound? Like, I think I am more than others, but I'm also really not some days. So like, what is that like? And what's it like to be on the other side of me at whatever level I am inwardly sound? So we actually did a, a big 360 review with, with a bunch of um, like sub criteria within the inwardly sound and others focus. And it gave us a roadmap. And I worked with him for a year kind of through that roadmap on my, on my own heart, on my own leadership, on my own ability to be inwardly sound. Um, and I had thought I had done a lot of work up to that point. I think it's the, the, it is a never ending game. It is the game of life. Becoming inwardly sound is not a destination. It is a journey and a pursuit and you have to, you have to be diligent Mm. on it. And I'll take what you said one step further. Yes, we need to work on becoming inwardly sound we need to to lead ourselves well and i think there's a there's one miss that happens after that where people go if i lead myself well then i can lead other people and i i want the world to start thinking if i can lead myself well then i can help other people lead themselves well Ooh, okay get the subtle difference there oh yeah 100 percent. yeah and so if, if we did that, how would it change how we're actually others focused, right? Yeah. We're changing our, our view on how we help other people not to, to lead them well, but how do I actually help you lead yourself? Well, cause you're not always going to work for me. Yeah. You're not always going to work for this company yeah. and I want you to leave a better human. Yeah. Well, I think that's such a, a profound and, um, that, to me, that's heart centric, meaning, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of this idea that I have is my choice is to be an incubator, not an incinerator as a leader. 
So I want to see you grow. I want to see you develop. And wherever you go, great. How can I serve you and help you? And if we have a great relationship, wonderful. Is that always the case? I'll be honest. No, it isn't. But that is my um, avenue and pathway that I want to drive down. As opposed to the incinerator who's like, I'm going to use them up. And yep. you know, people get burnt out here. And that's just the way it is. And after two years... Either I have to go or they have to go, meaning, you know, I have to move divisions because as a leader, they're done hearing from me. And to me, that's such a antiquated and or derogatory viewpoint if you think that, oh, at some point, the, the people that you lead or work with are no longer going to be able to hear your ability to lead them. That's a you problem. Yes. 100%. That's not a them that's a you problem. And when you see a pattern of that, that is a you problem. And, and I love where you say, it's like, how can I lead myself better so I can invite people, I can encourage, and I can empower others to lead themselves better? Yeah. I, I believe, without giving it total definition, that really gets to the idea of being a renegade leader. It does. It, at, the, at the end, the punchline of the book goes through um, you know, these six shifts and then the dignity that's created from each one of those and dignity isn't a word we use a whole lot in common language, but it, it's, uh, ex accepting of a person for their intrinsic value simply for being human. Right. So, so if we can dignify the people in our organization like that, that, what, that's what I, I believe in the end, that's what's going to matter, yeah. right? It doesn't matter how many widgets, how many dollars, like all of that's great. It's the game of business and I love it, but I want to see, I love your incubator. Like I want to see everybody leave going, I was incubated. Not that yeah. anybody's ever going to use those words, no. but that's, I want them to have that feeling about everything that they're doing. You know, I think back is Will Godara who wrote unreasonable hospitality and he talked about yeah. in their, um, you know, sphere of restaurants and what they did is, you know, they encourage people, if this isn't the right spot for you, that's okay. We'd rather you leave soon rather than later. And, and I, I believe if you go into, when you're bringing on new people, when you're really developing that team, when you're morphing yourself and you're looking at it saying, Hey, how can this be the, if I'm thinking about myself as a renegade founder and you shared your experiences when you're like, dude, I'm out of here because I can't handle this. Quit putting, you know, me in a box. I'm going to do my own thing. It's the ability for, you know, working with someone and saying, Hey, I'm not putting you in any boxes, right? Yeah. I'm not doing that, but I'm also helping you and, and find the guardrails on your own through this entire process, because that comes back to me leading myself well, helping you lead yourself well. That to me is the process of incubation. Yes. And I never want to excuse bad behavior, but I do always check myself first. Is this a me problem? How did, not even is it, how did I contribute to this situation? Well, it, it also takes a whole lot of humility to be in that situation and say, oh, I can't go ask, you know, someone else in our staff to help fix this problem because uh, I got to make sure that I'm coming to grips with it per first and can sit at the, you know, the table behind you and say, I did this wrong. I, I have to fix it. I have to handle this differently. This isn't on any of you, but now I recognize it and everyone else is like, Phew, finally they did. And then we can all move forward. And what I've seen in my own situations where I've, I've done that, there's such a tremendous amount of relief yeah. and grace that's given that I almost have found that people are more willing to go to bat and help me get to where we all collectively want to go. Once I say, man, I screwed this up. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I've hurt you because I didn't know. So this is not in the book, but this is what I'm spending a lot of time thinking about um, and, and trying to practice living in three spaces at the same time. Oof, and okay. so this, the first space is gratitude. Yeah. You'll understand that. And it's for everything that is and, and everything that's, you know, got me here. And um, so just a space of gratitude and it has a lot to do with the past. And then we get to the present and in the present, I want to live in the reality of the moment. So what you're talking about is acknowledging that you screwed up. 
all you're doing as a leader is surfacing reality and everyone's relieved because they're experiencing that same reality. And now we're on the same page, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, same, same guy that quoted the heart, uh, issue also says that, a, a leader's job is to eat ambiguity and shit clarity, right? So like, what is, if we can say like, what is the reality right now? Uh, then we're able to deal with reality. If we're hiding that, then we can't deal with it. And that leads to the third one, which is in the future, and that's possibility. And so if we can ground ourselves in gratitude, make sure we're dealing with reality in the present and move toward the possibility of what could be, what could we create, what could we do together, what if we changed this, then we're always envisioning and moving toward a better future. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something. We're at a place where we could, we could be done with today, right? We've covered enough. We've covered maybe with those three things that you just told me. When, when I first said, hi, Benj, how's it going? And you're wrestling through the things that you're wrestling with. Yeah. Discern those three for me. Well, the, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's very, very relevant, right? So there's the, okay. there's the uh, gratitude of, oh my goodness, I can't believe what we've created, how good it is, the people we've attracted. Um, we've done a lot in a short amount of time. We've got a great team. Like there's just so much to be grateful for. Um, even the fact that, that we're in the place of stewarding over this business, this idea, this movement, um, is really, really cool and special. And then you get into the reality and the reality is like the bank accounts are reality, right? Like mm -hmm. our sales projections of reality yep. are yep. like, and we're, you know, where's that breakthrough going to come from is the, mm -hmm. the reality that we're sitting in wrestling with staring in the face. Um, but the possibility on the other side is, is like what we, our mission that we're on the purpose we're trying to achieve. Um, the, the ambitions that we do have and the, the, you know, I can see the path going this way. I can see it going this way. I can, I don't know about that path. I'm not so sure about that path over there, but like there's, a, we have some paths toward this possibility. Yeah. And so some of it's choosing the path. Some of it's believing in the path to do the work it takes to get down the path. I think what's exciting about that, and, and this is what I'll share. And this is the mission that I'm on is very much like yourself. And I just had a conversation with somebody the other day that going to be a podcast. And it was much this case is my charge is to help other leaders get healthy too. I think you could put that and label that on yourself as well from a purpose. And again, it would fit pretty well. Yeah. And here's what I know. It is especially what you just said and encouraging you with what you said earlier without any you know great deal to, but exactly this. There are plenty of leaders in our position, whatever way that may be in our world right now that are in some ways sick and tired of being hurt and seeing others hurt that we're like, there has to be a better way and whatever way we could push forward. And if we can do that collectively enough as a front, man, we're going to live in better communities and we're going to have better friends and we're going to have healthier people. And honestly, when we look at organizations and what we're here to do and that's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cause I, that is why the book exists and why we put all, all the labor labor of love hours into that is, is because we, you know, as leaders, we have such impact. We are ripples, right? A pebble creating ripples. And the conversation that I have with somebody that I work with goes home to their spouse and their kids and their soccer team that night, you know, there's just ripples upon ripples that we'll never even see. And so if I can help somebody accelerate their journey, um, that they're on through the things that I've learned and kind of synthesized as, as myself, but also watching a lot of other leaders, I get to work with a lot of leaders. So I watch them and I'm, um, I don't know if you know Enneagram, I'm Enneagram five. I'm studying people like what, what's making them tick. What are they thinking? How is the room reacting to them? All this. So I'm starting to synthesize the commonalities of, of founders and their organizations. And so I think there's something in here for everybody to maybe take a little jump forward. When I'm healthy, I, I'm there. 
fun, as an eight. When I'm healthy, I'm sitting there and I'm, okay, taking it all in and, and synthesizing that. And it's reality when I am. Yeah. Um, as we, you know, not even final points, but just kind of the, the last encouragement that someone that's reading this book, again, if it's for a founder and you're trying to go through this roller coaster that is leading and developing and building an organization, or if someone is working with that founder, um, you know, for example, if you were to give this book to the person you were, you know, the people that were working with you five years ago, what's the biggest thing that you hope they garner from that? Not in a, I told you so, oh, I knew it, but yep. how to be a part of the entire change and movement. Yeah, I think if, if somebody was to give this to one of my employees, my, my hopes would be, first of all, that, that they'd have some compassion that this leader is human and they're trying to do something new and different and pave a way. And so there's, there's a little bit of compassion for who that person is and, and how they're wired. And they are probably a little different than whoever's reading it. Um, the second part of it is how, how do I actually come alongside of that founder, that renegade to help them be the best version of themselves. And to, un to do that, you're going to have to understand how they tick, but also, man, if you can be the guide to help them shift from renegade founder to renegade leader, that company's like up and to the right forever. So you could play as big of a role in the story as you want to play. And this is a little bit of a, a map to how to do that. The, the last two shifts that you mentioned, the ethos shift in the people, people. Shift. Yeah. yeah. Um, and even really the destination shift, the number four, right? Four, five, and six. To me, that's so much more about who are we here to serve? What are, what are, what are we really, what are we doing this about? And this comes back to, again, you know, a little bit of sub line, a subtext to our conversation in, in really yourself is, yeah. what's that about? Well, you're, you're getting into the whole... Um, the soul side of the business and, and what we do at system and soul. And so, you know, the destination is, is really about, it's a mile marker. It's not even a destination, right? It's some target. Sometimes it's arbitrary. Sometimes it's very, very important and, and like absolutely the right thing. But the most important thing is the purpose piece of it. The, why are we doing this? Yes, we're going to be $40 million in three years, but why, why does that matter? Why does, Joe that works out front, why does he care high for $40 million? He might get a, you know, 3% raise along the way, like, or he yeah. might get a bonus or he might get, but like, yeah. that's not enough to compel people to feel like they're doing meaningful work. So yeah. what that's about is creating a story that other people can find their place in. Right. And so that's, that's the destination. When we get to the ethos, it's really about knowing who we are. So, uh, we, there's not a whole lot written about this or talked about, but companies take on personalities, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of our job as the founder, as the leader, as part of a leadership team is to decide who the company is going to be. Just like when we're talking about inwardly sound and others focused, right? As individuals, well, what is it if, if, the organization is strong in their identity, then they know who they are. They're not going to be distracted by shiny objects. They're going to know what they're about. They're going to know who their audience is, what, you know, their, their market and who they serve and how they serve them. So it's really about, it's more about who that organization is. And then when we get into the people choice, it's about how we work together. Yeah. And, um, that starts with, uh, the culture that we put the people into right? Like everything is environment. If I put a cactus in the middle of the rainforest, it's not going to do real well. Yeah. Right? So we got to make sure that we're matching up the, the people and the right environment, but getting really clear about the environment we want to create and engineering, we get to, this is the possibility, right? Well, what would I want my company to look like? What would I want it to feel like? What would the habits of the organization be that would make us different than other people? So, and then, and then, the second part of that is teaching the organization and teaching people how to be world-class problem solvers. So we talk about thinking in bets. How do we think 
uh, in a way of risk reward, opportunity cost. The renegades are super innate at this, mm -hmm. but certain people in the organization have never had the authority, yeah. permission, uh, or even the construct to think like this. So teaching the organization to be world-class problem solvers. And then the last one's leadership, which we've yeah. talked all about. I, I think there's a, there's an overlay as a parent who has two in high school, you know, a daughter who's almost 17, a 15, um, you know, you and I both share almost 14 year olds, man, that's a model for them. It, it really is like, where are we going? Like, who are you as people, but then having the authority, the autonomy and the power to make a decision, but still with it fit within the framework of us as a family. And I think if you can almost see it that way is as a leader, that is as much your responsibility to let your baby grow yeah. and let that baby fly, let that baby get out of the nest. Because a lot of, I think, renegade founders and from personal experience, they're so afraid of letting their baby walk that they'll never be able to run because they're afraid if it falls when it takes a couple steps. And I think that's where, again, that last piece of it, we really have to be comfortable and allow people to fail and say, okay, great, I failed too, right? We all have to, but if we can do it collectively together where we're improving, man, we're going to run and sprint faster than we ever thought we could. Is that well fit? said. Right. Yes, absolutely. All right. um, ben, thanks so much for joining me, man. Um, Pleasure. I loved you know, the book, I loved what you shared. Obviously it was a journey that I can relate to have gone through. And again, this seeing this, this death grip over, as I told people, overtake people, there is a better way. And it's just allowing yourself to find that pathway forward. Yeah. 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 Dude, excited. Uh, when does the book come out? Um, it's coming out in September. You, okay. I don't have an exact date. We're going to, um, if you want to be notified, you can go to system and .com forward slash renegades. Sweet. Bench. Thanks for being here. Thanks, man.